The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Business Reentry Strategies During COVID-19, presented by our sponsor, Heffernan. We're so happy you can join us. My name is Deb Beto, and I will be your moderator today, and we'll be monitoring questions you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's review a couple of key items. All of the webinar materials we discuss can be found at the Heffernan COVID-19 Resources website. I will be sharing this website information in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you're missing out on it right now if you can't write it down. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. If you have audio difficulties or a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again to the same number. If all lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative call-in number. Please feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the chat box or questions box during the webinar. If you are using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, and then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will work your questions or feedback into the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or question during the session, we will be online afterwards to respond, or we may follow up in an email if we run completely out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 48 hours after the webinar. This will be a one-hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout, and the presenters will be answering questions at the end. And lastly, we have a number of webinars upcoming covering a variety of topics, including those listed at the Heffernan webinar website. In addition, we offer the mandatory preventing harassment training in English three times a year. With that, let's begin today's webinar, Business Reentry Strategies During COVID-19. We have a panel discussion today from three different companies. From the law offices of Hirschfeld Kramer, we have partner Dan Handman. From the talent network of SVS Group Incorporated, we have CEO Eugene Lupario, and Director of Human Resources, Melissa Fidelli. And from Socius Insurance Services, we have Senior Vice President, Ryan Apgar. So let's start today's presentation with our first presenter, Dan Handman, partner of Hirschfeld Kramer. Hi there, thank you, Deb, and thank you everyone for coming. Good morning or good afternoon, based on where you are. Um, I, the other day over the weekend, I was I went swimming with my kids and to be honest the pool was a little cold um, and I did not want to go in my kids desperately wanted me to go in so like all good uh, arguments we compromised by doing what they wanted to do so I realized there were really three options at that point option one was I could not go in option two was I could slowly dip my toes in Option three was I could just jump in and do a cannonball. Um, and it seems to me that when we're talking about re-entering the economy, restarting the economy, re-entering the workforce, that analogy is very apt. You can do one of those three things. Or if you're in Wisconsin, there's actually a fourth option, which is that it's like the goofy brother-in-law who grabs a cell phone out of your hand and pushes you into the pool. That's what they did in Wisconsin yesterday. Um, the truth is, this topic, uh, we could spend uh, two hours talking about from a legal perspective. I'm going to condense this into, as best I can, into 15 minutes. I will tell you that on our firm's website, we've been doing a blog series called Planning for the Rebound, which I encourage you to check out. It's still going on. Um, the, uh, the second thing I will tell you is that today we will be going live with a checklist of things to do. So if you want, take a look at our website, hkemploymentlaw.com, and you can see all of those items. Um, if you could flip to the next slide, Deb. Um, you need to define your goals here um, when you are planning it, putting together a re-entry plan. And from my perspective, there are four goals you should have. Number one has to be the safety of your workers. Um, number two, 
communicating effectively. That means from you to them and from them to you. Number three, flexibility. You have to be flexible in this environment or else you will not succeed. And then number four, of course, is staying open. And in order to stay open, you have to do one through three effectively. You have to look out for the safety of your workers, you have to communicate with them, and you have to be flexible. There are, in my view, seven categories, seven things you need to do to achieve these four goals. If you could move to the next slide, please. So there are seven steps to effectively rebounding. Number one, creating an effective planning team. Number two, implementing the proper safety protocols. Number three, thinking about how, if at all, your employees will travel or whether they won't travel. Number four, deciding which employees or how many of them would, uh, would be successful doing remote work. Um, number five, communicating with your employees. Number six, creating a robust reporting policy so that your employees feel comfortable addressing their concerns um, with you. And number seven, creating a rapid response team so that if there is any type of an infection that's present in your office, that you are able to, uh, that you are able to deal with it effectively. So we'll touch on each of these uh, quickly. If we could go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> So you need to create a planning team, and this planning team needs to consist of numerous different functions, HR, finance, legal, communications. Now, in the process of dealing with all these issues, and I've been spending the better part of the last two months dealing with COVID-19 issues, it has occurred to me that as a lawyer, um, they, uh, I am not entirely qualified to advise my clients on every single issue there is. I am, not, I am not an epidemiologist. I don't have a scientific background. I majored in political science and I went to law school. There are, however, just like any case I have where I need a health expert or a safety expert, there are plenty of experts out there. And we are working in consultation with those people to make sure that your workplaces are safe and clean and healthy. And that you have an effective um, that you have an effective uh, pool of resources in place. And to that end, we're using safety consultants, environmental consultants, risk management consultants. So you, before you even start planning, before you even start coming up with the plan, you need to have a good planning team. And these are the functions that, at the minimum, have to be represented in there. If we could go to the next slide, please. Safety protocols. This is what you hear about most on the news. Um, there are companies out there that are offering temperature taking stations. There are also companies that are offering the, uh, the no touch uh, thermometers. Um, you would be well served to consider having those. Um, when COVID-19 testing becomes more readily available, you may want to think about using it. A lot of employers, I will tell you, are using questionnaires, and I've put together a number of those for employees, questionnaires that deal with how safe are you, how safe have you been, have you been to any, any difficult places, have you uh, suffered any symptoms that are commonly associated with COVID-19. And in fact, the government, the EEOC, has said that unlike the normal situation where you're not allowed to ask any of those questions, you can ask those questions in this uh, situation. Masks and PPE, we've all heard about. Um, customer and vendor rules, you have to think about what you're going to do as far as letting your customers and vendors into your office if you wanna give them the same type of questionnaire that you're giving your employees. And then it's the other issues that you see, social distancing, sanitizing your office. We work with experts on, on all of those things. And one thing you're seeing is that employers are starting to limit traffic in common areas. They're closing down common kitchens. They're staggering restroom breaks. They are, uh, one of the more difficult issues is employers who are in a big building and have to use an elevator. That presents a unique challenge and there's not really a consensus on how to deal with that. But these are the types of things you need to think of. 
we could go to the next slide, please. Travel restrictions. Um, it used to, this was the post on our website yesterday, our blog post yesterday. It used to be that travel was essential in all sorts of businesses, um, both local and, and far away. Um, no one's traveling now. If you look at the, the statistics, it says travel is down by 85 to 90 percent, at least air travel. Um, there are some basic rules. I don't think that's going to pick up anytime soon. I don't think anyone is eager to be traveling, but there shouldn't be any traveling to, to COVID-19 hotspots. Um, there is a CDC guidance on travel, and in our checklist, uh, which will be released later today, there's a link to it. You can also Google it and find the CDC guidance on travel. Um, if employees are sick or showing symptoms of COVID-19, even honestly, if they're just sneezing and coughing, they shouldn't be traveling. And tr employees need to report to you whether they travel, not just if they travel for work, but also if they travel for personal matters. You need to know if employees are traveling so you can make an informed decision about what they do, about how you deal with them in the workplace. If we could go to the next slide, please. Remote work. Um, apparently, a friend of mine who's in the commercial real estate sphere told me that 54% of Americans surveyed said that they have no interest in returning to in-person work. Um, so you really need to, people now feel that they can do their jobs remotely. You need to determine which positions really need in-person attendance. If there are high-risk employees, risk of, of serious complications if they contract COVID-19, typically the elderly and pregnant women are the two highest risk categories. You want to consider having those employees not come to work and do their work remotely as much as possible. This is an area where finance definitely needs to be involved. You need to do a cost analysis. You also need to know that if employees work from home in California, the law says that you're required to pay any necessary and reasonable expenditures for them, which in practice plays out to two major categories. Number one, cell phone bills. Number two, uh, internet bills, Wi-Fi, at home Wi-Fi. Um, the consensus is that you, you do have to pay for at least a portion of those costs. So you need to consider that cost analysis. Um, if employees return to work, you should, you should consider having staggered shifts, so not all of your workforce is there at the same time. Um, if employees are working remotely, you need to make sure their IT is working. And again, you have to have clear forms of communication with this as with everything. If we could go to the next slide, please. Communication is, is going to be key here. You need a clear policy. You need an FAQ page. You need to explain everything that we've just talked about to employees. Employees are very concerned that returning to work is not safe. You need to explain to them why it is and how you will protect them. And it can't just be one thing, and it can't just be something, it can't be legalese. You have to explain it to them in, in an approachable, understandable way. Um, so you need a clear policy and an FAQ, and you need to update employees regularly on what you're doing. If they have questions, you have to answer them promptly. If there's a way to put together some online training, you should do that. Um, and you need to prepare your HR professionals to answer common questions. There are all sorts of questions that people have. We're seeing the same ones over and over again about safety and, and social distancing. You need to be prepared to answer those questions through HR. If we could move to the next slide, please. A reporting policy. Um, employees are going to want to know that you have their, that you have their backs. And so what you need to do is you need to come up with a way that employees can report their concerns to you. They can do it anonymously, that you can quickly investigate anything that they say. And you need to, they need to know that they will not be retaliated against. It's more than just putting it in writing. That's important, but that's not enough. You need to, you need to explain it to them and you need to tell them earnestly that you want to know about these issues. Uh, and the next slide, please. 
The last issue is to have a rapid response team. If you learn of an employee infection, the government has said you have an obligation to notify others, but you cannot identify the employee by name unless he or she gives you his, his or her consent to do it. We have created a consent form. If you feel that's important, you can do that. Um, the other things are, are, are pretty obvious. You need to direct the employee to stay home. Um, you need to, there, there may be an obligation to notify state or local officials, clean your office, and let the, let the workers know um, that there has been to, uh, the presence of the virus in the office. All of these things have to be done by your, by your management team. And that's why it's so important to create the right team at the outset of this, uh, at the outset of this process. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, this, this got a little garbled. This is a, 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 uh, a piece of the checklist that we created, which will be live on our website later today hkemploymentlaw.com. You can also email me directly, which is dhandman, H-A-N-D-M-A-N, at hkemploymentlaw.com. If we could go to the next slide. Um, yeah, that's our, that's our blog is at the address there. Feel free to consult it every day. We have new updates on there. Um, uh, you will you will see we are actually today is day number 13 of our 20 part uh, series called planning for the rebound and I think we have one more slide I take it back I am done I'll pass you off now to Eugene and Melissa from SVS Thank you, Dan, and thank you to the folks at Heffernan for putting today's webinar together. And thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to spend some time with you today on a topic near and dear to all of us. First quarter of this year has been the start of an unprecedented time that has impacted every element of our lives. If you think about it, sheltering in place, experiencing a world of social distancing, working remotely, simple tasks such as going to a store for groceries has become a new challenge. For all of us, our world has been interrupted. Unemployment is at unprecedented highs. Schools stop, family gatherings cease. Our future is uncertain in lots and lots of ways. It seems the only thing that's constant is change. Not only have our personal lives been impacted, but the way business operations are designed and managed is going to have to be reconstructed as we try to go forward. We're all now in a world filled with uncertainty, fear, change, and so many other unknowns. And as organizations begin to return to a new normal, we will all be charged to look for new and innovative ways to keep businesses moving forward. Today, I'd like to begin exploring and talking about how we can best consider opening our businesses. How do we prepare ourselves and embrace the challenges in front of us? In short, what the heck do we need to begin thinking about? As a business owner myself, I think about things in sort of a triangular way. These things are all interconnected, and I call them the three pillars to success. Each needs to be carefully managed if we plan on being successful. These pillars are finance, operations, talent management. Next slide, please. Each day, I am challenged to find better ways to align our firm and better manage all of these issues. Because it seems that the future is forever going to be uncertain and ever-changing, we have to look at how to cut costs, create greater levels of efficiency and productivity, and at the same time, embrace some of the new norms such as social distancing. I don't know if any of us are going to find this easy. I sure as heck know I don't. So I think it's great we join webinars and hear ideas and talk about what is working or how to better navigate this stuff. In fact, our CFO, Adam, and I feel like webinar junkies these days. We attend lots of these things, trying to learn and understand what's going on around us. As employers, we're all confronted with the challenges of what opening the economy means and looks like. All of us need to pay careful attention to our business and what the effects of opening means to us. So let's touch on each pillar with a focus on one in particular. But first, our operations strategy. What is my business going to even look like? How am I going to drive my organization to higher degrees of efficiency with a reduced budget? And at the same time, deal with the increased costs of running my business as I now need to acknowledge social distancing protocols. For example, I might be required to provide PPP or PPE and other safety equipment. I may have to have a different way of checking people into work with temperature checks, as Dan said. 
ensuring that we're wearing face masks. How am I going to deal with all of this? To me, it sounds as though things will need to be quite a bit different, and those changes will be critical and have an impact on the second pillar, our financial strategy. So now I need to ask, how can I reduce my expenses and operating budget in order to match a lower than planned revenue model? If I'm going to deal with social distancing stuff, this probably means fewer workers in my factory or warehouse, fewer guests in my restaurant or store. How the heck am I going to deal with all of that? If you consider the airlines for a second, they're talking about removing the middle seat or at least not selling it to a customer. Or what about the restaurant that now only was able to fill half of their space because of these new social distancing requirements? How do they survive with much less opportunity to generate revenue? As sad as it is, people are going to have to change the way they do things. This is the kind of thing that's going on everywhere with big businesses and small, which brings us to the third and final critical strategy, talent management. This is an area where we want to spend a bit more time getting into things. How am I going to engage and train my workforce going forward? How do I lead them in such a way where they can be more efficient and prepared to take on more responsibility and a greater workload? As things come back online, we're all going to be trying to do more with less. We need to carefully plan this out and ask ourselves, what does this look like? What is my going forward plan? And we have to recognize that the economy is going to stutter. We're probably going to see starts and stops, and so we must be able to quickly and carefully adjust to that. But how? How can we remain nimble in our reaction to sudden changes as we go forward? Our managers and HR teams have a big time challenge in engaging, motivating, and supporting all of our folks as they begin to return to work. As I think about potential solutions to support businesses during this time, I'd like to turn it over to Melissa, who will talk a little bit about the issues and costs surrounding human capital and why using a staffing agency may be a strategy that makes greater sense today than ever before. Melissa? Thank you so much, Eugene. As we move to the next slide, um, let's all start talking about talent. So talent is our greatest asset in organizations, yet at the same time, it's one of the greatest costs to the organization. And there's this fine art and science behind figuring out the exact amount of people you need to meet the, support, the demand in the marketplace. So as we begin reopening and really thinking about what our next steps need to look like, we need to get back to the basics. That first step is workforce planning. Very simply, workforce planning is understanding what the organizational strategy is, ensuring that your talent is aligned to meet those goals, and also balancing the demand in the market with the supply of your talent. So this is one of the basic components of human capital management, yet one of the most challenging to manage. And we've seen this. We've seen it where we've had too much supply of our human capital in the workplace, not enough demand in the market, and all of a sudden we are burning through cash much faster than we are creating the revenues to support it. The result of that, you hear on the news all the time, they're the quarterly layoffs we all experience. So on the flip side of that, we've all been to the stores recently and we've experienced the other side. I refer to this as the toilet paper shortage, where the demand is much higher than the supply that we have to provide. When that dynamic occurs, what happens is the company loses their brand's name in the market. They get unhappy customers, they have lost loyalty, and the result of that is changing over to somebody else that can supply them. So as we start with the basic of focusing on workforce planning and managing the demand and the supply, we also have to look at all of the cost components because we know when we hire an employee, let's assume at $50,000 base salary, that isn't what we actually pay for that employee. So we have to layer into all of our plans as we move forward what the true cost is. So let's explore some of these. If you could please move to the next slide. Some of the costs associated first as we look at benefits. Benefits according to the business labor 
statistics back from December of 2019 had the cost of our benefits on average in the United States at 29.9%. This included things such as paid leaves, insurance, retirement, legally required benefits such as Medicare, Social Security, federal unemployment, state unemployment, workers' compensation, not to mention shift differentials, commissions, et cetera. That was a statistic from December of 2019. We just heard from Dan who mentioned the FFCRA. We have extended FMLA leaves. A lot of changes that have occurred within the dynamics of our legal system. We can anticipate the benefit component will go up. So that $50,000 employee that we hired is now about $65,000. As we continue to look at reboarding people into the workplace, we know based on the 2018 training and industry report that the average cost to train an employee on an annual basis is $1,000 on an annual basis. Well, we also just heard that we have to retrain our workforce to work differently, to engage in social distancing, meaning we're gonna have machines down, less people in the workplace at one time. How do you manage even simple things like the copier in the workplace? PPE will be required and required to use correctly. So that training number that we experienced back in 2018 on average, again, is going to increase significantly. In addition, we have some interesting dynamics going on with talent acquisition. So as we look at the Society of Human Resources studies, we find on average in the United States, $4,000 costs associated with any hire that we make. That's about a 42 day spread from opening the requisition to actually filling the position. Those costs include advertising, recruiting, referral bonuses, software licensing, agency fees, travel, career fairs, et cetera. The dynamic we're faced with today that we haven't had in the past is we have a workforce that is hesitant to return to the workplace in many situations. And there are factors behind that. We have federal subsidies on our unemployment that for some of these individuals have increased their earning potential or their earning opportunity higher than what they've had should they return to the workplace. We have employees that are afraid to return because they have people at home that are autoimmune compromised. There's a lot of stress and psychological challenge to returning and reopening the workplace. And for the first time, we have young families that are experiencing the inability to get daycare for their families. We talked a little bit about the employment regulations. And on those employment regulations, we've mentioned the challenges with the FFCRA, FMLA, for the first time having a remote workforce of hourly employees that dabbles into the FLSA, obviously ADA concerns, discrimination, retaliation, which Dan had mentioned earlier. We see new laws coming out, not only from our federal government, but shortly thereafter, modified by each of the states. And so we have a very fluid, complex environment on top of the costs associated that we already discussed. And it brings us to one of the high points of our conversation today, which is safety and security, which is top of everybody's mind. Back in 2018, the National Work and Safety Council identified the total cost in the US for safety and security as $170.8 billion. Of that cost, $52.4 billion associated to wages alone. That's not including medical expenses, admin expenses, et cetera. And we know that number is gonna get much larger. So we have not only a challenge in front of us of finding the balance between our workplace, the demands in the market that has significant ebb and flows, but also the rising cost of employees in the workplace. This pandemic, as we've just talked about, has caused us all to make a pivot, not just human resources, but every business and every leader. 
we have to go back to the basics and the fundamentals. Our eye needs to change. And so as you're thinking about reopening your organization, my recommendation is to pull out the talent reviews, look at all of the talent pools that you've put together, identify the critical roles that will drive the success to your organization, the talent that is most important to retain, and focus your energy, your time, and your resources within that space. And that is going to look very different. The eyes and ears of every leader are going to have to be with every employee in the workplace, listening, understanding their concerns, and ensuring that they're all getting addressed. Focusing on engagement and motivation and one of the most challenging times our country has ever seen. So how do you manage that with bringing back your entire workforce and some that don't even want to come back? So we have to, as HR business professionals and leaders, think differently and smarter and more creative and look for partners that will help us all come together to get through this really challenging time. Three years ago, I was sitting as an HR director within a business unit. During a normal economy without a pandemic, the challenge of workforce planning sat upon all of us and was challenging to manage through. Now we're also being forced to revisit all of our policies, our practices, and re-educate everyone on how to work. And so in order to really focus on the top talent and top roles within your organization, I would suggest and encourage you to do one of the things I've done in the past, which is look to a staffing partner. And so as you do that, the relationship that you have ensuring the cultural match and the match to what your needs are will be so important as you manage through the ebbs and flows of the business. And so, Eugene, I'd like to ask you, what are the things that we should look for as we're reaching out to find that talent management partner? So, I get asked that a lot, to be honest. Um, and I, I generally put that decision making into four separate buckets. The first one is an easy one. What does the agency that I'm talking to specialize in? What are they good at? Are they maybe they're an IT firm or they focus on healthcare or legal or finance? Is, are they focused in the field that matches what you need though? For example, I wouldn't call an agency that places healthcare professionals if I'm working in a manufacturing facility. That would make no sense to do something like that. It's an easy thing to learn what an agency does, but if you're not sure, you can get some help by looking at the agency's website or talking with some of their references. You can also learn on any trade groups you may be a part of and see if the agency you're talking to is recognizable. The second bucket is where is the agency located? You should look to find one that understands your geography. We all know the challenges of various commute times in our markets. Your staffing partner should as well. It's hard to have an understanding if the firm is located out of state. For those of us in the Bay Area, we all know that a 15 mile commute could be an hour of driving. That might not work. Someone from out of the area likely won't know that and suddenly they're trying to send you folks that can't physically get to your facility. So I would encourage you to look for local help. The third bucket is cost. And a lot of decision makers put this at the top of the list and given the reduced budget we're all facing, this may be an even bigger driver in how decisions are made. I'll share with you, however, that the agency world has become a highly commoditized industry over the last 15 years. Well, while some agencies used to make the case that candidates only signed up with them, that generally isn't the case today. In fact, it's not uncommon for a person to sign up with as many as six or even seven agencies. Candidates can do so much now without ever having to leave their homes, and signing up with agencies can be done in just a few minutes. So it's become more difficult for an agency to boast of a workforce that nobody else shares. And because of this, we're all forced to price our talent at similar price points. But still, there are firms that may charge a bit more. So carefully consider those firms, but do not be afraid to compare price points. And for the niche players in the agency world, you'll see price variances for sure. But for those of us who are not focused on unique skill sets, such as nurses on call or soil engineers, pricing generally runs about the same. But the fourth bucket, the fourth bucket is where you separate the agencies, and it's all about service. 
In fact, the level of service you receive may be, justifi may be a justifiable reason you pay a little bit more. You want a staffing partner who can match your sense of urgency, who understands your needs and is listening to you. You want a business partner who can grow with you as your needs may change. I often tell clients that I want our firm to be evaluated not by the sales rep who landed the account, but rather by the workforce we put out to the client's site and the level of service they receive from us on a day in and day out basis. Ultimately, that client's going to call us back because the people we placed did a great job and we remain attentive even after the placement has been made. You want an agency that checks in with both you and the people they place, ensuring that things continue to go well. And if there are any hiccups, those issues are addressed immediately rather than brushing them under the carpet. The customer service piece is critical and will go a long way in helping create a solid long-term partnership. And while this seems so basic and easy to address, you'll be surprised at how often this piece gets overlooked and neglected. And if you aren't sure about an agency's reputation, before you sign anything with them, do some homework. Get references, check the agency's Yelp reviews, peek at Glassdoor, all of these things can help formulate your next steps going forward. I hope that's helpful. At this time, I'd like to turn it, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Ryan Apgar to finish up our discussion today. Great, thanks Eugene. Uh, and thank you everyone for participating. Uh, as outlined by Dan, Eugene, and Melissa, uh, the topic of reentry maintains some significant amount of complexity to it. Uh, and with that, there's a number of strategies and actions that can be taken. So for the third phase of our uh, presentation today and topic, uh, one that we'll explore is insurance and more specifically how insurance can help both following a loss and ultimately as a proactive uh, resource to mitigate the overall exposure tied to reentry. Uh, next slide, please. So as we dive into explore where insurance role fits, uh, there's a number of insurance policies that are available to both uh, companies and the management teams in, in navigating these uh, uncharted waters. Obviously, the property maintains business income, casualty relating to work comp, directors and officers liability, more so tied to shareholder or regulators uh, actions, uh, and which is more specifically tied to financial performance of companies or poor performance. Uh, and then lastly, and the real focus for today is the employment practices liability. Uh, in a broad sense, just to lay the foundation of what that type of coverage extends to, uh, this is geared for wrongful acts arising from the employment process. An employment process extends from the application phase through actual employment and ultimately departure if that uh, occurs. So as we narrow the focus a bit further into employment practices liability, some key areas of focus, which will be largely tied to the reentry topic at hand, would be breach of employment agreements and contracts, uh, harassment allegations, which usually and most notably are focused on a sexual harassment basis, but in the context of reentry are actually non-sexual and um, can be picked up and tied to employment practices policies. Uh, from there, there's the obvious discrimination allegations, race, religion, disability, age, national origin, etc. And in today's contemporary employment practices uh, marketplace, these policy forms are notably robust in what they had been in years prior. Uh, so they do extend well beyond that to employment related defamation, emotional distress, or hostile work environment. Those three alone, obviously, are cast a wide net and can be quite ambiguous uh, in, in allegations against the management team or to a company as a whole. Other factors to note as we dive deeper into the employment practices side for reentry would be the fact that these policies do maintain first and third party coverage. This first party being tied to your actual workforce, your employee base, and the third party coverage being the quote unquote non-employees customers, uh, clients, vendors, uh, any third party which you interact with or your employee base interacts with uh, during the course of business. And the final keynote to note uh, as we progress here is the actual or alleged language found in EPL policies. And the big portion being the alleged that it does not take a proven fact to actually trigger defense costs uh, in navigating or uh, defending against these allegations of wrongdoing. So with that focused understanding and really where employment practices uh, provides coverage, 
let's move on to the next slide and explore um, reentry concerns as it relates to EPLI. So a, a great area to focus on is where, oh, I think we went one slide too far. If we can move back, there we go. So a great area of focus would be looking at how underwriters and where underwriters are evaluating risk uh, for each individual account. And most notably, this can be categorized into three segments, as you note here. Branch closure, reduction in force, layoffs, remote workforce, and then the big topic at hand, re-entry and rehiring. Historically speaking, branch closures, reduction in force, and layoffs have been the focal point from an underwriter's perspective, and in their eyes, carries the greatest exposure. Uh, the common questions that you'll see from underwriters in the event of such an occurrence uh, is did the insured or policyholder engage legal counsel in handling such? Were severances offered and were waivers obtained? If answered favorably, you could assuage underwriters' concerns pretty easily. That being said, you put that in the context of our current COVID economic climate, and a lot of these closures and reduction of forces have been seemingly government imposed uh, tied to the shelter in place mandates. So it's very difficult for a company to answer those favorably and therefore difficult to address with their EPL carrier at renewal. Uh, as it progressed uh, to the actual shelter in place, a lot of the employee population, as we know, moved to a remote, remote base and remote workforce. That in itself carries its own added exposure as it most notably tied to wage and hour concerns, monitoring staff hours, paying overtime where needed, et cetera. It's probably the, the least uh, concern from an EPL underwriter perspective simply because wage and hour is not readily available or always offered. It's something you need to negotiate um, or your broker needs to, to do so on your behalf. Uh, the final big component of this and really where the underwriter's uh, attention has been as of late is the re-entry rehiring process. And so as we touched on some areas of focus before as it relates to EPLI coverage, breach of employment agreements and contracts, an allegation of such uh, as we noted, can trigger defense costs just to defend against it and navigate those allegations. Discrimination is probably one of the larger concerns from an underwriting perspective, and this is really tied to uh, concerns that employers who have never engaged in a rehiring reentry uh, program or uh, system are going to isolate employee groups. And while it may be uh, in the best interest of those individuals, for example, they're identifying those most at risk of uh, potentially being affected by the COVID pandemic, that those individuals actually are protected classes as well. So for example, the older uh, uh, generation, uh, the pregnant um, employee population, and those with pre-existing conditions, asthma, diabetes, et cetera. So moving on to harassment, uh, which is often overlooked but wildly relevant, is those that actually do engage and return back into the workforce, there's an employee-to-employee -employee interaction. Under these really strenuous times with health concerns on the line, uh, it's ample uh, scenario for employees to harass each other if they feel another employee is not fulfilling their obligations to upkeep the code or health of those around them. And then similarly, as we noted, first and third party coverage, that can extend to your employee interactions to customers, clients, and vendors as well. Workplace bias uh, is largely being driven by the media against race, ethnicity, protected groups, uh, and those who are deemed to be at fault or most relevant and tied to this pandemic. And that can actually come in the form of discrimination and harassment in its own right. Wage and hours, we touched on misclassification, inaccurate hourly tracking, unpaid overtime, improper notice to impacted exempt status, employees, et cetera. And then the final uh, key item or area of focus on uh, EPLI as it relates to reentry would be the retaliation. So individuals that actually engage in whistleblower, uh, whistleblower complaints that encounter work comp com uh, claims, uh, claim FMLA or ADA claims, uh, if they feel they've been retaliated against for engaging in such, uh, that can be a discriminatory action by an employer. So with that micro sense and view um, under our belts, it's wise to also look at the macro standpoint from the EPLI market and understanding where these underwriters are actually operating from. So moving on to the next slide, please. 
Market trends within the EPL marketplace as of late uh, have been in a hardening phase. Uh, this started back in 2018, progressed further into 2019. While it was a slow progression uh, and there's still enough capacity and, and uh, enough carriers in the marketplace to help navigate tougher renewals or changes by incumbent underwriters and carriers, this is significantly dwindling due to the dramatic acceleration uh, of the economic impacts uh, as a result of COVID. Um, what are these underwriters and carriers engaging in? Some of the actions we're seeing are these quote unquote redlining of specific industries or regions. On the industry side, it's those most impacted from COVID and shelter in places such as hospitality, retail, healthcare, et cetera. And on the regional side, it's uh, those most litigious states or regions such as California and New York. And most specifically, uh, or the hardest of each would be Southern California itself. So with that, underwriters uh, are either exiting those regions and writing new business or renewals, uh, or they're imposing much more uh, higher rates, adverse terms for their insurance, et cetera. With that, when renewal cycles do come up, the underwriting teams are actually scrutinizing the reentry process and reduction in force process a bit further. They're asking a lot more questions. Uh, some are asking specifically about reduction in force, what percentage of the employee population has been affected, and most notably as the rehire and reentry process is engaged, what's the criteria that the business and the company, the management team is utilizing to identify what portion of the population will uh, return, and understanding the overall process itself. The absence of a process will lead to obviously a very difficult renewal and more adverse response from underwriters. Uh, other uh, approaches that we're seeing is policy term extensions. Some insureds tried to extend their policies uh, to get away from the shelter in place conditions until the dust had quote unquote settled and underwriters were not open to do so while they had been in the past. Uh, they would decline outright or sometimes actually offer extensions with altered policy terms and conditions. In addition, increased rates are being seen uh, largely across the board, but more so tied to certain class and locale, as noted uh, previously. That can range from anywhere from 15% to 100%, depending on the carrier, region, or class of business that any insured and company falls into. Uh, and then, in addition, carriers are asking insureds to put a little more skin in the game, so to speak, uh, by way of increased retentions or deductibles. Again, that can largely be tied to class and regions as well. Um, the second to last here would be added exclusions. One of the more common ones is that you are seeing reduction in force exclusions added to EPLI policies, especially when it's affirmatively noted that a reduction in force has occurred. Uh, these exclusions maintain notably broad wording, uh, rising out of attributable to any type of reduction in force. So in turn, such broad wording can extend to the rehire process itself. And when these exclusions are added, it precludes coverage outright from any of the aforementioned type of allegations of harassment, discrimination, et cetera. Uh, and the insured would not have any recourse via their policy. So it's incumbent to navigate those and eliminate those or reduce those as much as possible. Uh, the final and most drastic uh, approach that we're seeing by underwriters is non-renewals. They're outright exiting writing business in certain classes and regions as noted. Uh, in those cases, they have to give ample notice to their insureds but it does put the insureds in a precarious position to try to find replacement coverage in what is being deemed a very hardening market and rapidly hardening market. Uh, next slide, please. So with that extremely dire outlook, uh, what can you do? Um, really our recommendations in how to utilize your EPLI policy and navigating the reentry process and ultimately your upcoming renewal with your carrier if you do have it, is to review and understand your insurance policy, your EPLI policy. Um, and I should take a step back that if you don't have EPLI, while it is a hardening market, we are seeing an uptick in businesses that have previously purchased it, exploring it for the first time uh, and getting some form of coverage to help transfer the risk itself. So for those that do have the policy or those that are exploring an EPLI policy in today's climate, fully understand the nuances that are found in these policies. They are unique, they are not standardized. Each policy is relatively different from the next in terms of the, the language each carrier utilizes. While they offer similar coverages, the wording itself is where uh, the rubber meets the road. 
So these are claims made policies. There's significant nuances. Ensuring that you understand that is vital and working with your broker to do so. Uh, separately, when is your renewal date coming up? How does that interlay with you know, the shelter in place imposed, the phases that the governments are actually rolling out to reopen businesses, et cetera? And then ultimately key clauses within these policies, your knowledge provision, when you actually are being noticed and become aware of a claim and how you report that to the carrier and ultimately how defense is appointed. Does the carrier have the ability to allow you to elect counsel or is that the carrier's right? Um, other definitions as well is who is an insured, part-time, full-time, seasonal, outsourced, uh, employer um, employee bases or independent contractors themselves 1099 and then the definition of third party as we noted as well the customer base or vendors that you're interacting with it is key to note that within EPL policies there is a bodily injury exclusion that is a common exclusion in, in all, almost all EPL policies the card back to strive for is emotional distress bodily injury should be picked up more so on a work comp policy as we know but there could be retaliation claims as noted previously as a result of a work comp claim being filed that can then later trigger an EPLI policy. Again, all of these are features that can be explored with your broker. From there, we would highly recommend accessing the policyholder risk management features offered to you from the carrier. Uh, not only will they provide significant value add, but then sharing the fact that you are accessing such resources with your underwriter at renewal will help assuage underwriter concerns and hopefully result in more favorable renewal terms for you. Uh, another component there, as, as Dan talked about previously, is developing an overall strategy for uh, the reentry itself. Uh, so not only to benefit yourself again, but also to share with underwriters and help mitigate their adverse reactions to the current climate you're operating in. That can uh, tie back to consulting with legal counsel during the reduction in force, the reentry plan, engagement and uh, management team and board level strategy meetings, sharing such uh, notes that you may have available for underwriters, and then implementing a cohesive reentry plan, ensuring that it's unbiased, non-discriminatory, that there's due process within the workplace, effective complaint uh, procedures, and accessibility for all resources being offered, old and new. And then if applicable, while we understand it may not be in every scenario, Severances being offered, waivers obtained. That always puts uh, EPL underwriters uh, more at ease. Uh, and communicating with individual employees and at-risk groups regarding their level of com comfort to return uh, or not return at all. At day's end, uh, we recommend be prepared for changes at renewal. The marketplace is shifting given this unprecedented uh, economic impact um, and it's seemingly by the week and month. So engage the broker uh, that you have um, for further discussions, there are ways to strategize around this uh, and ultimately find the best terms possible uh, during your upcoming renewal cycle. So with that, thank everybody for, uh, for your time again, and um, we'll answer any questions that come in. All right, we do have some questions, so let me get back into our question and answer session here. Okay, our first question is for uh, Dan, and let me back up to that, my. Okay. Dan, if an employee has been traveling, should you have them quarantine for 14 days? Oh, hold on, let me unmute you. Uh, <laughs> All right, oh, sorry. Can, can, can you hear there me now? <laughs> okay, you can hear me now? Yes. Um, it's a very good question. Uh, the answer is uh, it depends where and uh, for how long. But if they were traveling to anywhere where there has been um, a recent or a recent COVID breakout, um, I would say it's generally a good idea to requ require it. Um, it's better safe than sorry. I should mention, by the way. Um, I think it was late last week, the governor of California, um, and he's done a lot of good things. This was not one of them. Um, he issued an order which said that in workers' comp cases, there is now a presumption that if, if an employee gets sick with COVID-19 at work, there's a presumption or at, at COVID with COVID-19, um, and he's been returned to work, there's a presumption that uh, it was a workers' comp compensable injury, which is dramatically 
uh, increase the stakes in the workers' comp field. I'm not a workers' comp lawyer, but it seems like a particularly crazy thing. So when you're talking about things like travel, it's best, better safe than sorry. I mean, I think for the most part, you want to avoid travel as much as you possibly can. But if it has to be done, and if someone travels to somewhere where there's a, a high population of COVID, infected patients, then I would say yes, quarantine is a good idea. Okay, and our next question, our next couple of questions are also for you, Dan, so stay on the line here. Uh, there's, a company that's, okay. there's a company that's planning to open the office and ask everyone to return to the office. For employees who are concerned, they may allow them to continue to work from home. Oh, gosh, they may, oh gosh, they may allow them to continue to work from home for a time, but, and they, but they don't intend to pay for the staff's home internet or anything. Is there a problem with that policy as long as they adhere to CDC protocols? Uh, if you are making work available to them and work going to work is safe um, and they're returning to work, their true decision not to return to work is solely out of a fear of COVID-19, not because they have it or they're taking care of a family member, or they're on some protected leave, then the answer is chances are in that situation, you're probably okay not, not paying for as much of a share of those things as you did in the past. Because the law in California, there's two core parts to it. It's labor code section 2802. You have to show that their expenses are necessary and you have to show that they're reasonable. And so are they necessary if you're already providing them with an office and a telephone and an internet connection? Well, no, they're not necessary. However, I will tell you, even before COVID-19, there was a whole body of, of law coming out on cell phone usage and internet usage. And employees tend to use cell phones, even personal cell phones and personal internet um, for work-related reasons. So employers typically we're providing some portion of compensation for reimbursement for those. I would say the, those numbers have gone up during the pandemic. Um, I think they could go back to normal levels if in that situation that you just described, Deb. Okay. And um, there are companies that think that creating the consent form is a really good idea. Can they compel their employees to sign that consent form as a condition for coming back to work? No, it's entirely voluntary. Um, if they, if the, the law is that you cannot force um, disclosure of who the employee, the infected employee is. There was a lot of debate about that. Some people think that's a good thing. Generally, the privacy uh, proponents think that's a good thing, and the, the health and safety proponents think it's a bad thing. They came down on the side of the privacy of proponents. So you cannot force anyone to sign it. It's an entirely voluntary, uh, it's an entirely voluntary process. Okay. And there's a little bit of confusion about whether or not to notify state or local officials. Do you have to notify them if an employee tests positive? So there, it's not entirely clear. Um, there are provisions in workers' comp law and in OSHA law, and California has its own, California has its own OSHA law, Cal OSHA. Um, there are provisions in both of those that require disclosure of workplace accidents or industrial type accidents um, or industrial type um, illnesses. And there are times where you do have to make disclosures of that. For example, you've heard recently about all the meat, pla meat packing plants in the Midwest. If someone gets sick at one of those plants, they have an obligation to notify the Department of Agriculture. So the answer is it really depends on your industry and the type of business you're in. And um, you need to, that's something you need to consult with either counsel or HR on. Okay. Um, one more question about the consent form, and then we'll move on to some questions for Eugene. Um, on the consent form, what Exactly, can employers ask without overstepping the privacy boundaries? Well, there's two different things. A consent form, I think. I think what the employee, what what the question is directed to, is a questionnaire, not a consent. Right. Form. Yes, you're right. The consent. Question. Yeah. So a questionnaire. Typically, you're asking about um, you're asking about the types 
of symptoms that have been associated with COVID-19. So typically it's a fever, cough, runny nose, um, things of that nature. On the EEOC's website, they issued a guidance. So ordinarily you're not allowed to make inquiries about someone's uh, health condition. So for example, you're not allowed to just go, and you'd be surprised how often this happens, but you're not supposed to ask someone, do you have any plans to get pregnant? Um, that's the most obvious one. Well, the EEOC made an exception in this case because they said that asking about COVID-19 related conditions was for the employee's own health and safety. And so there are questions you are allowed to ask employees. You're allowed to do the basic temperature testing or COVID-19 testing when it becomes available. Um, but you should really consult the CDC and the EEOC's websites to see what you can ask about. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that offline if someone wants to talk about it. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move on to some questions for Eugene and Melissa. <clears throat> uh, first one is for Eugene. Should employers put a temporary stay on capping out PTO accrual since no one should travel for the foreseeable future? I'm actually going to defer to Melissa on that one. My quick answer is no, but I think Melissa could speak better to that than I can. So again, the question was, should employers put should employers a PTO cap? Put a temporary stay on capping out PTO accrual since no one should travel for the foreseeable future. Uh, um, so my answer to that would be you certainly can change your policy. Um, however, doing so right now, you can also take PTO to stay at home or do e-learning and, and things like that as well. So I think you need to consider all of those options. It's also something you need to talk with your finance team regarding. So if you're looking at making any modifications, obviously PTO is also a liability on your books. So you want to make sure you're working hand in hand with the finance team. But from a goodwill perspective, and especially recognizing the challenges that face people right now, not just from a concern of being medically sick, but also from a mental health perspective, I would encourage you to continue to move forward with the PTO policy that you have. Okay, and we are up against our time clock here. We're just a slightly after 11 o'clock. We do have additional questions, so if you're able to stay on the line and hear the answers to those questions, that's fabulous. Otherwise, we do want to respect your time today. We will be sending out a link to the recording later today. So if you have to leave, you can um, uh, listen to the questions later. But hopefully our panelists can stay on and answer these last few questions. Um, so, Melissa, um, there's people from, that are represented in various states that are attending this webinar today. How do they get information on the specific HR laws in their state? Or is there a one-stop solution where, where they can go to? I think that's a great question. Um, there's not a one-stop solution at this point in time. My recommendation is always you know, leverage the agencies you work with, right? So definitely if you're members of the Society of Human Resources, that's something that you wanna leverage. Some states do, such as like Cal California has the Cal Chamber, um, which is a great group that provides information specific to California state legislation. Um, I also recommend um, signing up on any Twitter information or feeds that you can get directly from the the governor of that state. Um, you'll see a lot of information coming through there. Also, the unemployment websites for those specific states. So most unemployment websites have done a fantastic job of including very specific information on state laws, not just uh, for unemployment, but COVID at large. Okay, our next question is for Ryan, but I have a feeling uh, Dan might be able to help with this as well. If a company requires all employees to return to the office, including employees that have unmet childcare needs, how do you balance that against discrimination concerns? Yeah, I would actually defer to Dan just from a true legal standpoint. Right. Uh, so it's a question of uh, child care needs versus what was the other part, Deb? 
So the question is, if, if, if we require all employees to return to the office, including employees that have unmet child care needs, how do we, we balance that against our discrimination concerns? Got it. Got it. So there's a couple things you have to take into account. First off, is that one of the laws, um, which we mentioned earlier, is called the FSDRA, called the Stands for the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act. If you can say that five times quickly, you're <laughs> a better linguist than I am. Um, the FFCRA um, requires you to provide paid leave up to two weeks for someone who has unmet child care needs as a result of the coronavirus. And as of right now, that's any parent. I mean, I am a parent myself, and I had to lock the door where I am to make sure that my eight-year-old didn't jump in to uh, share the presenting duties with me. So everyone is in that boat right now. Um, uh, so, but it, it's a total of two weeks um, that you uh, that you have to provide for that. After that, it becomes a question of, you know. There, there are plenty of people out there looking for jobs, but there are also, I mean, there's certainly a lot of people, but there are, it's also difficult to bring uh, people up to speed on your operation. And so making a termination decision because someone can't return to work because of child care needs at this point is a really hard decision to make. Um, I, I think one, I think it was Eugene. Uh, and uh, Melissa, who said, or talk about the cost of bringing new employees in, and that that would be very, very significant, even in this challenging time. So I would be very careful about doing that. It's certainly something you want to consult with legal counsel on. Okay. And Deb, if I could just back up yep. the last question that uh, Eugene and Melissa fielded, someone asked about um, a resource for. Uh, for multi-jurisdictional, multi-state issues. Yep. Um, my firm uh, started a group called the Employment Law Alliance, which has members in each of the 50 states, throughout, also throughout Canada and in every country, Western Europe, Australia, Asia, and so on. Um, the website is ela.law. Again, E as in Edward, L-A.law. Um, if you go on there and sign up, it's free. There's something called the, uh, the, uh, employ the, it's the, uh, I forget what they call it, the multi-jurisdictional employer handbook or something like that. Um, it's an employer ham employee handbook covers common issues for every jurisdiction throughout the U.S., Canada, and everywhere else that's involved. That's a great resource. Thank you. And are, yeah. are the presenters able to stay on for four more questions? Sure. Okay. Um, can employers require testing before someone returns to the workplace? And if an employee tests positive, are they required to report that to their employer? Can they refuse to take the test or refuse to report? So uh, if an employee refuses to take the test, you, you can keep them out of the workplace. Um, that much is clear. Um, and if, if, if an employee refuses to have his or her temperature taken, same thing. Um, if an employee refuses to report to you uh, to answer a questionnaire about whether they've had those types of symptoms that are commonly associated with COVID-19, then you can take them out of the work. Okay. If employees are in an open office at their desk, is a mask needed while they sit at their desk or only when they're walking around? So this is one of the questions that I would refer to Dr. Fauci, who unfortunately couldn't make it for this presentation. Um, but I would say, I, I, I would say, I, I think you're, you're crazy if you're not having your employees wear a mask. Okay. I think it's absolutely going to be the minimum standard of care. Okay. Are you required to pay employees if you force them to quarantine for 14 days after they travel? Good question. Um, the answer is probably it depends. Um, if they are taking leave, if they haven't taken their FFCRA leave, the two weeks of leave, um, and you're quarantining them and you're forcing them to quarantine, then yes, you are required to provide them with uh, pay. Now, I will mention this. This is an important distinction. The FFCRA applies to employers with 500 or fewer employees. 
in places like California and some other states, um, the, and in some cities like Los Angeles and, and San Francisco, for example, um, they have filled that gap. So it's also if you have 500 or more employees, um, but the FSCRA applies if you have 500 or fewer employees. Okay. If an employee refuses to come back to the office because of fears, can they be terminated? Uh, if it's a fear, if it's purely a fear that they're just afraid of contracting coronavirus, then, then yes, you could terminate someone's employment. But typically, it's much more complicated than that. It's not just a fear. It's a fear coupled with, as, as one of the other presenters mentioned, I have someone at home who has a, a compromised immune system, or um, you know, I'm the caretaker for an elderly person, or something like that. And in those situations, you want to be very careful. I mean, I will say this, the, the notion of terminating someone is always a difficult one. Um, it's always something I caution employers to be very careful and to think through every step of it and to think of it from the employee's perspective. Um, I think that's doubly true in this pandemic. Uh, you want to be really careful when there are legitimate concerns out there. And I think as, as, uh, as Melissa pointed out earlier, you also have to think about the morale concerns and, and the, the issues that raises. Um, one of the things I mentioned is having clear communication with your employees and having a robust reporting system. And if employees feel that they, if they report their legitimate concerns to you, um, that they will be retaliated against or that you know any people people who are trying to protect themselves are terminated from employment it's going to bode very poorly uh, for your employee morale people are going to want to return to work less and that's not your goal so be very careful when you're planning those things right and i think this next question has to do with the uh, california workers compensation executive order that uh, regarding workers' compensation that you were talking about. If an employer right. travels for personal reasons, can the employer ask them to sign a release for the employer if they were to get sick and not blame the em employer? So to, to get out of that presumption that it, it occurred at work if the employer knows that they traveled for personal pleasure? That's a good question, and I, I, I don't know the answer. I will tell you my strong suspicion is you can ask, but it's likely not to be enforceable. Um, I don't think you can prospectively, meaning in the future, waive any claims that might occur. Having said that, if that situation uh, described in the question were to arise, I think you could very easily overcome the presumption in the governor's order. Okay, and some sources have said that that governor's order um, is actually not in um, opposition to California employers because the um, the reporting of the COVID will not affect the X mod. Do you know anything about that? So the X mod is essentially the 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 rating that a company receives for workers' comp purposes about how dangerous the workplace. So, for example, if you run an amusement park or if people are operating heavy machinery, there's a higher what's called an X mod rating than if you're just in a general office setting where it's really not the, the biggest danger is tripping over, you know, a box or something. So the, the answer, the question, is, the question, whoever asked the question is correct that uh, I did hear that it will not affect X mod ratings. However, um, just because it doesn't affect, and that means that your rates, if you're at higher X mod rating, the higher rates you pay for workers' comp, um, just because it doesn't affect the X mod rating doesn't mean that it is friendly to employers. Anytime there is a presumption that you did something wrong, it is, uh, it is dangerous for employers. And so it was something that caught my colleagues and I very much by surprise and, and gave us a lot of concern. Okay, and one last question. If we do not have a travel work restriction but decide to implement one now, can we go back and require employees not to travel if, even if their travel arrangements have already been made? 
Oh, I see. So if someone's already made travel arrangements, can you tell them that they have to cancel it? Right. I mean, the answer is, if it's for, if it's for work, the answer is yes. Um, if it's for personal travel, um, the answer is you, you can't force them not to travel, but you can certainly impose restrictions on them coming into the workplace or things of that nature after they travel. Okay. So thank you everyone for attending today's webinar presented by Heffernan. We will send information by email with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation, including a recording on the Heffernan website. And thank you to all of our esteemed partners for and presenters for your time and expertise today. We hope all of the attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of your time. And be sure to join us on June 2nd for HR and payroll retention, record retention policies. And thank you, everyone, and have a safe day.